Hello everyone, this is a seminar for history through uh, Czech film. Um, I would like to say that it's not really a seminar, it's a kind of lecture which is supposed to be providing a background uh, for what we've seen. We've seen an entertainment film from 1933 and I, as I was telling you on Wednesday, uh, people were dancing on the edge of the precipice. You know, probably you won't, you won't be too surprised to hear that uh, European history in the 20th century is often a kind of history of horrors. Just quite interesting, this is totally off topic, but uh, as I was cycling here, I was talking to a colleague in Prague who uh, has just been to, a, to an interesting seminar. Uh, apparently, you know that when Stalinism ruled in Eastern Europe uh, before the death of Stalin in '53. In Russia, this happened in the 30s. They would just actually uh, uh, sort of arrest and arraign top uh, officials of the communist regime, uh, accuse them of absolutely absurd uh, crimes that they hadn't committed. They would torture them and force them to learn their confessions by heart, and then they would actually execute them. And in 1952, they did this to the general secretary of the Czechoslovak Communist Party, Richard Slansky, and uh, some of his colleagues. And it was anti-Semitic, this thing, because uh, uh, most of the people, or all of the people actually executed uh, in November 1952 were Jews. And uh, why this seminar took place, a French filmmaker uh, uh, made a new, doc new sort of feature documentary about this because they discovered in some bankrupt factory boxes of 35 millimeter film from 1952 with these people, these accused being basi reciting basically these, these, these uh, confessions before then they were executed. So I'm just thinking about these horrors of the, of the 20th century, which mercifully didn't occur in Britain because it's an island, but uh, we don't know what will happen <laughs> because we have a war going on and Putin is threatening us to blow us all up every day on Russian television. They say, why don't we bomb London with nuclear weapons? Every day they say that, you know, so, uh, uh, so we'll see. And also then I, I keep going on about it. Italy, uh, Sweden, France, what have you maniacs in London who are shorting the pound, maybe we'll all be, I was actually th thinking about this, these poor people here having mortgages because they won't be able to, to afford them. Anyway, enough of this, let's get on with what we're doing. Um, I just want to basically do a little intro introduction to the whole topic of, uh, uh, well, I mean, Czech culture and Czech history. I'll, I'll start in the Middle Ages a little bit. I would like to, I'm recording this for the, uh, for the uh, two o'clock uh, seminar where I have a timetable clash. I will not be recording the whole hour because in the last 20 or 25 minutes uh, of this uh, class, I want to play you a film about the history of interwar Czechoslovakia, 1918-1938. Um, and uh, it would be silly to, to sort of look at it through this video, so there's a link to it uh, on uh, Moodle, and please watch it separately. Um, okay, so what I basically want to do, uh, and again, please do have a look at, at the uh, screen. <laughs> the Czechs and the historical experience, these are just a few notes. Uh, I suppose you should be informed about the mythology that, you know, the British had this, or the English rather had this mythology of exceptionalism in the British Empire, which no longer exists, and nonsense of Brexit and all that. But the Czechs have similar ones. So, yes, uh, I'll go very quickly through this, and then I have a PowerPoint as well. Uh, they, uh, the Czechs were a fairly important medieval kingdom under Charles IV in the 14th century. It's interesting, he was a very benign ruler. Uh, that's the one who built that Charles Bridge, which uh, you find in every beer advert on British television, you know, that Gothic bridge in Prague with those Baroque statues on it, and also basically built the new town and everything. Um, there's an 
he, he ruled in the second half of the uh, 14th century. Uh, quite a stormy economic development he caused. The Czechs were also very lucky because uh, since they were slightly out of the way, um, they avoided the plague. Uh, while Europe in the second half of the 14th century was absolutely decimated by these repeated plague uh, pandemics. Uh, this didn't happen in the Czech Kingdom until later. So it developed economically while uh, Western Europe stagnated. But of course, as Marxists would probably tell you, if you have stormy economic development, you will start having contradictions in society between classes. And this happened a little bit towards the end of the 14th century. Um, the church was incredibly powerful, and it was also the Catholic Church. It was also becoming very, very corrupt. And there were various, throughout Europe, various preachers who were actually trying to rectify this. Uh, they, they were moral critic, critics. And obviously there was John Wycliffe in Oxford, who was then pensioned, uh, neutralized, but nevertheless he wrote some stuff. It was interesting that even at that early uh, stage, there was a scholarship for Czech students in Oxford. Um, you may well ask, how did they make themselves understand? Well, in the Middle Ages, all university students eat your heart out, spoke Latin. Right? So that, that, that was the lingua franca. So anyway, they brought John Wycliffe books into the Czech kingdom. And there was this uh, religious reformer. He was a very good preacher. He, was, he also taught at university. His name was Jan Hus. It's quite interesting. I was saying this in another class yesterday. Uh, the Scottish Protestants absolutely love this early uh, history of Czech Protestantism. And if you go to the library... You, and put, put Hus into the library catalog, you will find a lot of books in English published in the 17th century or 18th century sort of extolling the virtues of these people. Anyway, so Hus, I wouldn't say, well, yes, he did invent Protestantism in a way, but primarily he was a moral uh, critic of the church, had the church behaved morally. I mean, uh, some of these uh, uh, sermons of his have survived, most of them, I mean, and I mean this, this irony, like, I mean, priests shouldn't be tending pigs. They should be pendi tending souls, you know, and stuff like that. Um, so he was a preacher before television. There was this Bethlehem chapel in Prague where he uh, kind of was a kind of celebrity, spoke to sort of uh, three to 4,000 people at each sermon. At the same time, he had these links at the university, links to the king. But, of course... Uh, the Catholic Church didn't like it. They had this church council in Konstanz in southern Germany. They invited him there uh, he, because he was an academic, uh, had this foolish academic notion which academics in this country still have. They think that when they present facts, and uh, they are right, it's enough just to present facts. And everybody will kind of collapse and say, oh, you're right, because obviously you discovered the fact. But this is all about this managerialism at British universities and how British academics are feebly trying to fight against it to no avail. Because what matters is power, not the truth. And this is what, of course, happened to poor Jan Hus because they, he got there to Constance and they, although he, was, he had been guaranteed safe passage, they told him, actually, you're a heretic and you will recant, otherwise we'll kill you. And he said, I'm not going to recant. And so they burnt him at the stake. And because he was incredibly popular, this was in 1415, um, and um, because uh, he was uh, incredibly popular in the Czech kingdom, Czechs got incredibly offended, and they kind of started to wage war on the rest of Western Europe, and they were very lucky in having this incredibly uh, talented uh, military commander, Jan Žižka, and they won against the rest of Europe. And basically, to cut a long story short, in about 1436 or whatever, there was basically a compromise. The, the Church of Rome, uh, the Vatican kind of reluctantly accepted their existence. And so the Czech Kingdom, since I'm talking about it, very early became the first Protestant state in Europe and was a Protestant state throughout the 16th century. It was... Uh, 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 a country of religious tolerance. Uh, it's really quite interesting because uh, at one point I was doing something about history of censorship and 
there were about 10% Catholics living in the Czech Kingdom then and 90% Protestants. And there were these squabbles, but they had this law that each religion can publish their own religious stuff on condition that they do not attack the other side, right? Which was fairly uh, kind of reasonable. But uh, in 1526, um, uh, the, dynasty, the ruling dynasty ended and the Czechs um, did a silly thing because there was a uh, sort of the state treasury was indebted so they elected a, a candidate who offered to pay for these debts and uh, he was a Habsburg, a minor, a minor kind of uh, prince of that was really not very bright because the Habsburgs were due to become one of the most powerful Catholic dynasties in uh, Spain and Austria. And so there, there was a line of Habsburg Catholic kings in the, this Protestant Bohemia from 1526 onwards. And the conflicts between the population and the Catholic monarchy became ever stronger. And there was a war in 1620. And this war was basically a uh, kind of, um, well, Czech Culloden, which was the Scottish catastrophe in 1746, the Protestants lost and uh, the Austrians took over and introduced, nobody's seen anything like it, kind of modern uh, Catholic absolutism. And uh, so th there is this kind of uh, mythology which has started, uh, uh, the Czech Kingdom was a part of this Catholic, the Austrian, later Austro-Hungarian Empire. Um, uh, from 1620 until 18, uh, sorry, 1918, the end of the First World War. So basically, we suffered for 300 years. It was probably slightly more complicated. We don't need to go, go into this. Especially, well, in the 19th century, like the Welsh in the 20th century, the Czechs had this national revival, cultural emancipation. And of course, in the second half of the 19th century, um, of the Austro-Hungarian Empire became democratic. There was this parliament in Vienna. It was really quite interesting. Uh, the uh, last decades of the 19th century, the Czech part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire was the most industrialized. It was kind of industrialized in a very similar way to what Britain was under Queen Victoria. And also one interesting thing which really developed were all these, there was this very vast network of uh, associations, especially kind of like trade unions or or, uh, uh, or artisan associations, or professional associations. So a fairly sophisticated uh, political and social development. Now, um, in uh, the, the First World War, during the First World War, the uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire became quite a police state, and the Czechs had a sociologist politician, his name was Thomas Masaryk, he was born in 1850, at the, in uh, 1914, at the age of 64, when most people go and retire, he actually left Austria-Hungary and tried, went to the West, tried to persuade Western politicians to um, uh, break up Austria and create a plethora of independent states. And he was actually ultimately successful in this. But as I, I think I said uh, last Wednesday, I don't know whether it was such a good idea. It would have been maybe much more, this is sacrilegious, I mean, because everybody in Central Europe loves Masaryk. Uh, I mean, uh, it would have been much better to democratize uh, Austria-Hungary properly. Hopefully then you wouldn't have had Second World War. I think historians should never do this. Like, I mean, what would have happened if, but nevertheless, uh, probably not. And uh, I mean, basically, if you create an independent state and it only lasts for 20 years, that is not a very successful uh, project, is it, I would say. So then what followed, you had the Nazi occupation, then you had the democratic interregnum, and then uh, you had the communist era, and we will be looking at all this uh, via these films, rampant Stalinism, uh, Stalin died in 1953. This is what I was talking about, the killing of uh, Mr. Slansky in November 1952. Then uh, there was this, uh, there was stagnation for about 10 years, but move against the liberalization, this 63 to 68 was really quite a brilliant period, you'll see it in those films, because the uh, cinema, uh, rock music, French theatres, literature played really 
uh, a glorious role in the, the, this period, pushing uh, the, the doors towards, open towards freedom. Unfortunately, in 68, you had this Prague Spring, which was a kind of all media of orgy of freedom, and then the Russians invaded in August 68. What followed was a, a clampdown, the new Stalinism from 1970, uh, the so-called normalization. This was the expression of the new communist ruler, Gustav Husak. The situation had to be normalized. They kept normalizing for 19 years. Um, what was different between Stalinism? There was at least a part of the population in the early 50s who really believed in communism, utopians, enthusiasts. Since communism was thoroughly discredited because all this stuff about these uh, crimes uh, were presented in the media in 68, I remember it, I was about 15 te fantastic television uh, programs, victim and the secret police interrogator, why were you trying to drown me in that bath? You know, these kind of interviews. So obviously in 1970, nobody really could believe in it anymore, but anybody who was in a job was subjected to an evaluation and comrade, was it an invasion or fraternal help? And if you said it was uh, an invasion, they sacked you. So basically for uh, job reasons, and it was incredibly degrading and demoralizing uh, the whole nation. I as a teenager was absolutely horrified how people who were basically absolutely passionate about uh, freedom and democracy, how they could turn so quickly and start repeating that rubbish again, right? But of course they realized that um, um, they were a colony and uh, you couldn't actually free yourself uh, really from Russia without uh, it collapsing in Moscow. So, uh, and they, they all celebrate that communism fell in November 89. But I think uh, it was not their merit. It was basically that the geopolitical situation changed. So uh, that is basically the whole uh, history in a nutshell. 1319, what do I have time for? I'm talking too, too much. Um, I was wanting to play you a, a bit, maybe just a bit, uh, of this Um, will it work? Yes. This is a uh, this is a fictional piece uh, uh, by um, yes, okay, of Czech television, and this is Masary, that man who broke uh, Czechoslo broke up Czechoslovakia, and uh, I have this. Th there are no subtitles. It's called Great Demolition, 1918. I will try to play a bit of it just about his arguments. Uh, he's talking to the Prague governor, Austrian Prague governor Thun here, and um, see whether it works. It's from 1318. I'll read it, yeah? Will it work? Come on. Right. Could somebody turn off the light there? Because people on the video won't see this. Right. Over there. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Off, off. <coughs> Prague, the governorship, uh, uh, governor's office, 2nd of October 1914. Professor Masaryk, pane místo držitelí. Your Excellency Governor, I wrote you saying I disagree with action against the press of our political party. Our journal has been confiscated several times, and uh, people must not subscribe to it in the army and in army hospitals. They must have a reason for this, but we haven't been told any. 
The reason is that your newspapers support Russia, our military enemy, and that is not possible in a war, Professor Vasari. Our newspapers express the meaning of the majority of the nation. A majority without protest joined the Austrian army. Both the Czechs and the Germans demonstrated in the streets of Prague in support of the war, and then they joined the army in peace. I think he said no. Strange times. This morning a maid has come back saying that it is impossible to buy a goose in Prague. When she asked the Czech market sellers, they said, we are keeping them for the Russians. Are you really so looking forward to their hungry stomachs? It depends. Right. It depends. You have written a book about them, no? I have heard that many people in many places in Europe read it a lot, but in Russia it's been banned. If you went to St. Petersburg and wanted to read it to them, they would put you in prison. I'm not a supporter of Pan-Slavism, you know that. How old are you, Masari? 64. We are both old and we've experienced much. I've long been in politics. I was the chair of the imperial government and the emperor has chosen me to be a governor in Prague for the second time. Several years ago I was forced to resign because you, the Czechs, wanted my resignation. Now I may be forced to resign by the Germans. Both sides criticize me for being weak and for supporting unduly the other side. I've been serving the emperor for all my life. I love this country. No matter who lives in it. So many nations. I've always believed that the old Habsburg ruling family will be able to rule them. Vždycky jsem věřil, že jediný, kdo jim dokáže vládnout, je Habsburský panovnický dům. Prosím. Please sit down. You are not a nationalist. You were always against the revolution. You've always advised that the law must be observed to keep the status quo and to move developments forward in small steps. This is why your people hated you for this wisdom of yours. Now at the beginning of the war you have changed. Don't do what you want to do. Everything can be destroyed. You would not believe how easy it is to destroy everything. I'm not hiding my views, those that have not been banned. If the Germans came to control Central Europe, this would mean that they would also rule over my nation. This is why the Czechs have always defended Austria, because it protected them from this Germanic policy. But in the current war, when our empire is controlled by Germany, Czech interests are in conflict with the Austrian interests. We do not want to live in Central Europe, in an Austria which is going to be ruled by Germany. We do not want the Czech lands to be torn apart and subordinated partially to Berlin and partially to Vienna, the way the Czech German Imperial Court is planning this. I do not want that either. You don't have any power anymore to prevent it. I can see how the German officers in the Austrian General Staff behave towards the Czechs. I can see how the German, not the Austrian influence, impacts the strategy of press censorship. In the state's behavior towards institutions such as our Czech Sokol, I know that after mobilization lists of influential Czechs were compiled. These Czechs are to be arrested. I am told I am also on that list. No, I can assure you you are not on that list. I am trying just to explain to you that our resistance to Austria is not based on anything emotional, nationalistic. Our reason commands us to go against Austria. Nicely said. It is true. No, it is not true. You cannot give up your state just like when you take off your shoes. I love the kingdom in which I was born. Bohemia is my narrower fatherland, but I also have a broader fatherland, and that is the Habsburg monarchy. How come it is not the same thing with you? My kingdom has existed here always. Your monarchy arrived here and can leave again. 
Those are these infernal theories of yours about who was first in Bohemia. These are no theories. I do feel that this is my kingdom. What is your relationship to the emperor? What do you think? I do not have any relationship to him. You can remain sitting. He is your emperor just as he is my emperor. He has never been crowned in Prague. He is an alien emperor. Tell me, Masaryk, why are you doing all this? Why are you constantly pushing yourself all your life, all your life, hurtling from place to place, all those scandals, articles, campaigns, and all that time everyone verifies you from all sides. If you are in the right and you believe that you are, why do you, so many people hate you for it? Do the Czechs like you, perhaps? I'm not doing it to make them like me. Why are you doing it then? Why don't you leave your nation in peace? They want you to do this, this permanent uneasiness running from place to place. What do you want to hear? Why are you forcing your Protestant history on them and why are you taking away from them their Catholic gods with whom they have been happy for centuries? If you drive people out of the Catholic Church, do you think they will join that church of yours? Nonsense. They will become total atheists. I must destroy so that it might later be possible to build. You're, you are destroying things, you're destroying everything. But I will tell you one thing, you're calling out such ghosts from the past of yours which will one day materialize and fight against you. Each of us are different. You don't speak Czech. You didn't know how to speak Czech either when you came to Prague. Your colleagues from your Czech university were afraid you would be speaking German. But I have learned Czech. You have not. I'm asking myself, why does it always have to end like this? Why even the most intelligent people eventually succumb to the struggle? Who will win? The Czechs or the Germans? Over and over again. I've explained it to you. You pretend to be a scholar, professor, but what you're preaching is in fact only the voice of your blood. Something in your head tells you the others are different, dangerous, I must defeat them, I must destroy them. A dictionary under both arms, an armful of books, but in reality you're like a mad animal, Masaryk. I'm defending the integrity of Bohemia. Other mad animals, professors like me, but in Berlin, are planning to break it and to incorporate its best pieces in Germany. Even you, as an Austrian, will lose a bit of your territory, but you're not bothered because for you, all German-speaking people are the same. If the inhabitants of the frontier regions want this, and this is it, these are the historical frontiers of the Czech Kingdom. It's the legacy of our ancestors. We must not break it up. This is you all over. First you say science, then something happens in your head, and the thing becomes a legacy of your ancestors. How much does this legacy of yours weigh and measure? Has someone ever written a dissertation about it? Maybe you, you have written that Czech question of yours. You have changed. You used to be Austrian like me. Life is constant change. Once someone starts believing in something, fair enough. When in time he finds a better thing, so much the better. We are each of us different. I have wanted the same thing all my life. You are a conservative, landowner. You have always been one. I know whom I will be and what I will be doing tomorrow. You don't know it. I can't know it. My future life will change me. I will react to the changed circumstances. Fidelity is my virtue. To the inheritor of the throne, to the state and to the country. What are you faithful to? To myself. And to my God. Go, Masari.
Kuzkuzaj. Ostrze był Teryś. Yes. Šťastnou cestu. Pleasant journey. Is it also a, about Scottish independence this? Now, before I, oh, okay, I'm running quite late-ish, but I was talking to you, I was mentioning that, that uh, jazz music in that film last Wednesday was written by Pavel Haas, and uh, I have here, I don't have uh, re really time to go through this properly, where is this? Um, yes. Here, no, 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 no. Here. Yeah. The composer of the music for this film was indirectly murdered by the United Kingdom, I told you. Because they refused to give him a visa and, uh, and, uh, come on, open. Right. Um, uh, and of course he ended up in, in a concentration camp where they killed him. This is a PowerPoint, it's really about Czech musicians. So, uh, uh, this is what I've been talking about. This is this Charles IV. I, I'm not, you can have a look at it. It's on on a, a, a Moodle, but what I wanted to show you here is this end of this composers, and of course the last one was uh, this man, Pavel Haas, that's the uh, brother of Hugo Haas, the main hero, uh, comic hero of the film yesterday, and of course the director and the main hero of the film tomorrow. Pavel Haas came from a Brno Jewish family. His brother Hugo Haas was a famous comic actor in the Interwar Czechoslovak Republic. Pavel Haas composed music for some of his films, such as Life is a Dog, 1933. Haas's work comprises several dozen pieces and one opera, Charlatan. Jazz inspiration, modernism, varying styles. And when I am talking about this, I want to show you this. This is a 1657. This is a... 1657, right? Come on. 16. Right. This is... Testimony by uh, Czech writer Josef Škorecký, who... This is a BBC film about him. Um, who was an absolute jazz enthusiast, but I want this uh, yeah. to play you this little clip about uh, the concentration camps and, Jew uh, and the jazz musicians. A bass saxophone. Perhaps they were only a dream to the eyes of a complex hidden kid in the middle of Europe, surrounded by names that were to become entries in her own dictionary, Majdanek, Auschwitz, Treblinka. At about 1942 or so, a rumor spread in Europe, in the neutral states like Sweden, that awful things were happening in Theresien and in the other camps. And the Nazis wanted to counter that the rumor by inviting a delegation of the Swedish Red Cross to visit Theresien. And they simply showed the Swedish Red Cross that it wasn't true, that the Jews, the fact is that the Jews were concentrated there, that it was a ghetto, but a very liberal ghetto, and they had a cafe house, you know, and they played soccer, and, and they had a promenade, and all that. And it lasted for about two weeks. So for the two weeks, they actually forced the Jews to play soccer and to walk around the square. And they also um, permitted the creation of this band, which was called the Ghetto Swingers. And it was an excellent band because all the men were highly trained and very talented professional musicians. The band leader, whose name was Bedrich Weiss, was a Art of sex, prayer and priorities, and a great arranger. <laughs> Thank you. 
as the Swedish delegation left, uh, there was the end of it. You know, the ghetto swingers were sent to Auschwitz. That's one of the paradoxes of Nazism that, you know, the people who were in command of that place were brutes. You know, they were simply illiterate brutes. And they were commanding people who were highly cultured. And even in these terrible circumstances, they were able to produce culture, you know. You know, all young men of my age were simply drafted into the German industry. All right. And the most... So, finally, this film, and it is 38, so that I will be able to play the whole... Anyway. Uh, also, uh, ladies and gentlemen, from the second seminar, I hope you can still see me. Um, I'll switch it off now. It is, uh, I would like you to play this uh, Remember Czechoslovakia, an ITV documentary. It's, uh, you can find it on Moodle. Uh, there are two parts of this. The second part is really quite dated because it's kind of uh, geared around 1968. But the first part really tells you quite a lot um, about... Uh, the history of interwar Czechoslovakia and I'll stop this recording now and uh, we will watch it here and please you watch it at your leisure. Thank you.